I actually have, if you don't mind, I've got two points to question. The first is a question about uh, reducing the use of coal across Europe. Given the economic situation, current economic situation of fossil fuels in terms of costs. The coal point, the economic point, is, is a you know, crucial one. Um, but we have to face the fact that it is a huge source of not just CO2 emissions, uh, but also um, PM2.5 and in the UK there's been a lot of NOx emissions uh, from coal-fired power stations. So they have actually been shut down, quite a few in the UK. I'm not aware that there are any plans uh, across Europe to build more coal-fired power stations. The second question I have is about diesel, which now seems to be thoroughly entrenched in Europe and other places around the world. What are the alternatives in terms of fuel to replace diesel? There are alternatives, you know, we're not saying don't drive, um, you know, if, if it's a car, you know, get a petrol vehicle, preferably a smaller vehicle, but, a, you know, get a petrol vehicle or a hybrid vehicle or an electric vehicle. Um, and people say, well, look, well, what are you going to do about freight and things? And I sat in an event run by the Healthy Air Campaign, which is led by Client Earth in the UK, uh, sort of big seminar with about, I don't know, nothing like this size, but sort of 60 people. And the head of policy for the Freight Transport Association was there. And he said, everyone assumes they're not going to do anything, how do you cope with their diesel engines? And he said, we are planning on using gas, compressed natural gas, to um, carry freight into the most polluted cities. My view on technology is that um, technology silver bullets are always, basically inevitably, they fail. They are increasingly expensive to tackle smaller and smaller problems, uh, which is why we need to look at lifestyle changes and things. Uh, but my approach to technology, we've got 8,500 buses, which are diesel or diesel hybrid buses, you know, is that we need to do two things. They need to be done in parallel, we need to retrofit as much as we possibly can to Euro 6 and beyond um, for existing diesel trucks, which can achieve really quite high additional productions. And the other thing that we ought to be doing is, you know, if that's say 20% of our sort of investment pot, we ought to be putting 80% into the sort of long-term solutions um, of, of a, an infrastructure which is, as I say, perhaps biomethane or something like that, or compressed natural gas, even if you haven't got enough biomethane. When we have multiple objectives to uh, improve air quality in cities uh, and also other issues like climate change, I'm curious like, how you set up the 1% uh, uh, kind of uh, line to uh, be the criteria. What I was trying to do is come up with a sort of way of thinking about sort of how we sort of deal with CO2 versus particles or, or NOx. And the 1 to 10%. It's not scientific, it's basically sort of, you know, really just saying, look, order of magnitude, so if it was 7 or 8% or 12%. But the classic example is really, you know, if you look at sort of diesel vehicles, because that's what I was sort of specifically addressing, but it probably applies to, um, you know, many other things as well, uh, is that, you know, diesel was sort of sold, well, we can achieve a 1% benefit on, on sort of diesel. Uh, in terms of CO2 reductions, but of course it was m much more than 10%, it was more like 20 times you know, worse for particle emissions. So I think that's the message, you know, it's not a rigid 1 to 10%, it's basically just saying, you know, really um, what we don't want is the sort of thing that we heard from a Department of Transport minister in the UK uh, a couple of years ago, who basically stood up in a, you know event, it was a formal event after he'd spoken, but he said, I will not do anything which makes CO2 worse. Well, that's just complete lunacy. You know, if you rule out things which sort of have a 1% cost to achieve 10% benefits, frankly, we'll never crack any problem. Uh, it's that sort of dogma which has um, driven us into diesel and is causing this sort of public health catastrophe, you know, in Western Europe, for example. I heard you speak of the fact that London does not permit the burning of wood. How far does that extend? And second part of the question is, while you're here, sir, do you think you could convince our administrators to do the same thing for our cities? No burning of wood? What you can't do um, is um, burn um, you know, logs uh, in an open fireplace. There's a sort of loophole in the UK Clean Air Act which basically says you're not allowed to distribute wood, but guess what, the garages and the supermarkets um, stockpile it up um, and they're not distributing it because people go and collect it. We also have sort of funny rules about where 
they've had something called the Merton Rule, which gave developers special dispensations on things. If they used a sort of biomass burner, a boiler or something in these big office blocks, most of them actually it costs more than the gas anyway, so they're sort of tucked in a corner and you can't even reach them. But the other sort of very silly thing that's happening, but it's not silly, it's, it's positively dangerous, We've actually got um, buildings with their standby diesel generators to put power into the grid. Instead of peak lopping, um, they're, they're kicking up these standby diesel generators across London buildings to put power into the grid at sort of six o'clock at night. So we are getting some really stupid decisions because people are not thinking one atmosphere, they're thinking CO2 or something like that. Thank you very much, Simon. And can we all please thank Simon thank for a, a wonderful presentation.